Welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today, I am joined by a fellow British person, Gary Green, who is the MD and founder of Quantum, which is a, a business that specializes in digitization, AI, and robotic process automation. Did I get that right, Gary? Yeah. So right. <laughs> Excellent. Well, great to have you here. Um, would love to hear a little bit about your story. So you are originally not from New Zealand, but you moved here about 15 years ago. Yeah. yeah. Tell us a little bit about how you got to be where you are now. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I came to New Zealand 15 years ago and I had no intention of setting up my own business, but it's just circumstances kind of and opportunities arose and you thought, you know, why not? And it's probably about just over eight years ago, I came across a particular technology that was not being used in New Zealand. And I thought, hmm, must be a good reason for that. And I knew someone that was actually working as chief marketing officer for one of the major companies that did this technology, UK based company, but they're doing really well in the States and Europe. And I reached out to him and just saw that that technology could really help with transformations in New Zealand and for us everywhere that I'd worked before. So I reached out to him and uh, they had no intention of going to this part of the world, but said, hey, you know, Gary, I know you, I'll back you. Do you want to become a partner on this technology, which is Blue Prism Robotic Process Automation? And so approached a number of the businesses I'd worked with before and uh, Basically, cut a long story short, one of the major banks I'd worked at uh, basically was after this technology to see what it could do globally. And we're the only people in the market doing this. So we landed one of the major banks as our launch customer, which was fantastic. And we built the business out from there. And we landed other banks, insurance companies in this technology, health sector, clients, logistics, energy, retail. But also that this was a kind of starting point of where people looking at technology around automation could help the businesses become more productive and save cost, free people up from mundane activities, but also kind of de-risk their businesses. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of evolved as the technologies evolved and democratized. Initially, it was only in the realms of the big enterprise players. And now the technology is available for large, medium and small businesses. Mm -hmm. And we've definitely seen probably the biggest uptake in growth in automation and AI is probably around the mid tiers because they can just adapt and change quicker than their uh, bigger competitors yeah we were chatting before the podcast you explained the whole moore's law thing how obviously as things get um, more popular and technology moves forward it becomes r more readily available to everybody is that right yeah and so yeah moore's law is a kind of exponential series that basically one of the founders of uh, intel uh i forgot, I forgot his first name but basically professor moore yeah <laughs> he basically um <coughs> He basically in looked at that basically he could basically double the chip capacity every 18 months of mm -hmm. uh, their microchips they're producing. But this also meant then that effectively the cost was halving as well. Right. So, and it's a basically an exponential series. So basically every 18 months it goes from seven, four chips to eight to 16 to 32. And it's a kind of progressive curve uh, that goes up and people often kind of, uh, when you've got disruptive technology, it follows an exponential path. It flies very much under the radar mm -hmm. for many years and then suddenly pops up. So like chat GPT, people, where did that come from? But it's been happening for years. <laughs> yes, it's been and sort then, of building very slowly and then all yeah, of a sudden it... A, a hockey stick <laughs> yep. kick up. But um, what that means is that then it, it's seen as disruptive, but it's not necessarily that the technology that's disruptive. It's the business model that you can now, it empowers you to use that technology to do on multiple technologies. Mm -hmm. And as we chatted before, I said that, you know, there's a number of technologies, 20 plus technologies are exponential out there from artificial intelligence to robotics, to self-driving cars, to in medicine. Didn't you Bionic mention flying cars? No. Thing, I'm sure I heard you mention flying cars. Oh, yeah, <laughs> flying cars are basically drones. Yeah. Of, you look how drones have progressed well, and that's capability true. and yeah. everything else. And actually, it's probably you probably get adoption of flying cars ahead of self-driving cars because they're operating in a area of space where it's not congested or crowded mm -hmm. and it's easier to kind of deconflict them than in a crowded environment where you've got people in a complex environment like driving mm -hmm. which is much more challenging yeah so it's interesting that you these technologies and can also go into kind of fill gaps as well that don't that uh, you couldn't have done by other means or ways before yeah but what that means also with exponential technologies is that um and it requires a new way of thinking because, again, you can do things differently, but things move faster. It's that kind of movement move from uh, scarcity to abundance. So it's like with digitization, you suddenly can go from an analog world where you may have 
you know, a newspaper and now you've got it digitally or you've got photographs, now you've got them digitally. Yep. And you might have only had a few before to now you can take unlimited pictures. And it's that thing of go that once you digitize, the incremental cost of doing something is virtually zero. Yes. So the business model that was built out before was around managing scarcity. The future business model is now about managing mm. abundance. But that also means then that you've got to change your business model. But equally as well, the skills that you need for managing abundance and that digital world are completely different to scarcity skills. Mm. So you move to much more empowerment, having highly capable uh, people that are empowered to do stuff, not in a command control kind of regime. And they also self-organize mm -hmm. and do that. So you're basically... You know, a lot of the kind of skills that you need as a manager also shift and change and also as a leader. Equally, you've got to keep on top of this as well. And you can't rely on your skills from 10 years ago or 20 years ago because they're not necessarily relevant, all of them relevant to what's required in the future. Yeah. So that's probably one of also for takeaways. You've got to constantly evolve as well as a person and mm -hmm. learn and understand what's going on in the environment. But how can you use that or how can you upskill yourself or your team around that? Uh, not just on the technology, but ways of leveraging that technology. Yeah, and it's a completely different way. I think maybe you think about the whole abundance um, versus scarcity. I mean, I was, we were talking about photography earlier. You know, in the old days, you would take that perfect picture, um, and you make really sure you didn't waste any money by taking more than one one image because you had to pay to have them processed. Whereas now we have thousands of similar um, images, and how on earth do you manage that? Yeah. And that's the same in business, right? Yeah, and it's that thing of go that. Um, you've got access to so much data and information now and you don't know where it is no. and the quality of it. Yeah. And that's also one of the problems with AI that you, you want to train it, but your data is not great. Mm. It's not in one area. It's got potential bias because it was collected in certain ways or certain data sets. That you're well, at. They're seeing that with the image generation stuff, aren't there? There's a lot of bias going on in the, in the yeah. AI image generation. You, you mentioned that um, Westpac said earlier on this year that if you're not using AI, you'll be out of business pretty soon. I mean, now, we don't wish to scare people, no. but it is, it is going to be part of every business really in the future, isn't it? Yeah. I think the thing is, is that, in evolving as a business, you've got to constantly move forward because if you're not growing, you're dying effectively mm -hmm. because, you know, you've got inflation to deal with. You've got obviously demands in what the market's doing and, you know, market forces. But effectively, your competitors are using AI to get ahead and they're using it to be for a point of difference of how they can make themselves more competitive, how they can make themselves more productive, how they can get better insights into the customers, yep. how they can actually move quicker to evolve to those customer needs. Equally, staff, you know, aren't prepared to put up with mundane activity. Staff are a premium and your best assets. How do you attract talent and give them interest in work? So you've got to change the ways of what you're doing, mm -hmm. leverage these tools. And as I said before, it's not the technology that's disruptive, it's your business model that can be disruptive and how you leverage that technology in your business. And it's again, how you can you know, use your staff in the most productive way, how you can increase the productivity of your business, how you can improve your differentiation and how you can move faster. Mm -hmm. And again, from some of my background in the past, we had a thing called the OODA loop, which was um, in the military, you use it as a observe, orientate, decide and act. Uh, yeah. And the idea, and it's the same in business, you need to observe, orientate, decide, act. And you, the idea is that you can do it faster and better than your competitor. Mm -hmm. So that means that you've got to be able to see what's going on need to be able to know what's going on in the market. You need to be able to make informed decisions and then you need to be able to act. But you need to do that in a kind of seamless way and rapidly. Yep. And that's why I say medium-sized businesses are really well positioned because they can do all of that quicker. They, <laughs> they haven't got the legacy and, systems. Yeah. They haven't got all that, yeah, the, that previous behavior as well, I suppose. They're a lot flatter where yep. a lot of big enterprises have got many layers and legacy ways of doing stuff. Yep. And they're also set up for an optimal way of operating that's worked really well to get them to where they are. Mm. But equally, is that necessarily the best business model for them going forward when you've got to move quicker? Yep. Because, you know, we've got a range of clients from enterprise down to mediums and smalls, and they all work at different paces and, and decision cycles and yep. and so on. I mean, we cater for all of them, but you've got to be aware when you're, you're doing that. Mm -hmm. And if you're in a relatively slow market, that's probably not a problem but if you're in a fast moving dynamic market you need to be able to kind of increase that pace and I say use data and AI to augment those decisions. Mm -hmm. Okay so when businesses come to you what are usually the pain points that they're experiencing when they when they come to you? That's a good question. Various because it's often um, you know we get people that come like say you say oh I need to be using AI yeah. 
and you go, well, why? Because everyone else is using it. It's a buzzword. It's what's happening. <laughs> yes. And you're almost in that case, it's someone looking for a silver bullet and you go, there are no silver bullets. Is it to deal with something else? Mm -hmm. And we'd normally ask a few questions, you know, where you are, where you want to be, why do you want to get there? And what are the drivers? And then what, are, like I say, what are the pain points? And it might be that they've got to a certain level of growth and they can't go any further because yep. their operating model, the maturity of the operating model they're using, the maturity of the processes, the skill sets they've got, the market they're operating in, or some or fragmented data or a whole host of things. They don't have a unified view of the customer or they've got inconsistent view of the customer or or there's inconsistency of the processes running, which result in a, a variable customer experience and so on. Mm -hmm. So we, <clears throat> people will come and it's more of a symptom that we get rather than the underlying cause. So we'll very much then dig into what the underlying causes cool. are. Yep. And we often find that people want AI, but then you're going, okay, uh, have they got a vision of the future or a strategy? Yeah, great. If they haven't, let's get that in place because <laughs> then you know where your North Star is and what you're aiming for. Mm -hmm. um, have they got an operating model? Yeah, great. Is it being used consistently? Yes, yeah. no. If it's not, why not? How do you ensure consistency of operation? Because if you want to automate something or use an AI, you need a consistent process. And then what's the data you've got that you're looking at yep. around this? Have you, is your data good? Are you collecting good information of your customers? Or if it's all handwritten forms coming in, someone's going to type that in or a mix or <laughs> stuff. Sounds very similar to EOS, which is the work that I do with businesses to make sure that they have that vision that they're actually, you know, looking at the data. And and I think the, the IDSing part of it is getting to the real root cause because often the SEU say it's symptomatic. It's not the real cause. You've got to yeah. really explore what's, what's really causing it. It takes me back to um, <laughs> when I first started working with the Ice House many, many years ago. Uh, it was when social media was sort of, you know, uh, probably at the stage that chat GPT is now and we'd have people come in going we need to have social media and it's like what kind of social media what for what are you trying to achieve who are your target audience what do yeah. you want you know what's the the action you want them to take and you don't need to be on everything and you don't yeah. need to necessarily so for some companies actually social media wasn't required at that stage and as it evolved it became obviously more more prevalent so yeah yeah, so the key thing is you have a problem. You then think about, okay, what is the real problem? How do we get to the root cause of that? Then what can we do to actually uh, yeah. improve that? Yeah, Absolutely. Mm. It's like chat GPT. People go, oh, we should be using it. And yeah. you go, have some great tactical use cases. It's, it's a fantastic productivity tool. Yep. There's also known limitations because you don't want to offend the government, your company's trade secrets onto an no, open yeah. source that anyone can read. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it's like it's, it's knowing its strengths but also – potential risk factors and also how is it trained yes but again you know you, there's some fantastic use cases as well of where you can use it you can actually get your own instance privately within your organization mm. you can use it around your knowledge bases yep. of what you've got so you can use it internally go because you know it's like trying to search for information if you link mm. it to your kind of where your repository of all you know work that you've done or, yep. or knowledge bases and stuff and you can actually use it really productively there too. Actually it's really, it's really interesting a lot of my clients come in and one of the biggest um, issues that we have that are usually on the long-term issues list is mm -hmm. actually their um, their SharePoint or their you know their, their database of knowledge in the organization because mm. they people can't find things that they want and need. I know. Yeah. And it's conventional means of searching you know it takes a bit of time to yes. suddenly now you go if you can do this a bit smartly you suddenly go Mm, that's yeah. quite empowering so yeah excellent okay i want to talk a little bit more about your actual business as well because obviously you started this what, eight years ago and there would have been what you and one other who started that business and now you've got 25 staff in the business yeah. um and we talked a little bit about this out again outside the podcast where uh you didn't sort of really intentionally start off to create a big business you started off with the technology liking the technology and next thing you know you're, you're growing a business and it, mm. it's difficult isn't it at times yeah. <laughs> and it's i guess it's that thing of you you've got an idea and you see something a gap in the market yeah. and you go why isn't anyone doing that there must mm. be a reason and then you go people aren't aware of something so you test it with a few people and, oh maybe there is a market yeah and you start and that's the thing when you start on your own we initially partnered with a, an advisory company that i'd known for many years mm -hmm. and you know we started that journey together and we brought in a few people that were kind of short shared our vision and we're very much in a startup phase but as you grow you then get into the kind of the next phase of how you have to systemize in that and yep. some of the people you're in the startup phase just love pushing around with the technology aren't into documentation or stuff but for you to scale and grow you've got to systemize what you do have consistency yeah. equally when you start you're doing everything then you can afford to get a salesperson or a delivery person <laughs> and yes. start to offload 
on that to get you know but keeper and so on so yeah you kind of grow you make mistakes you make some good hiring decisions you make some not so good ones we've all been there i think yeah <laughs> absolutely and how did you i mean because you're right a startup has a very very different mindset to an established business and there is definitely different skills required um how do you make sure that you get the right people now because i'm assuming you're still growing and still looking at and engaging with people yeah. what do you do to get the right people on board i mean we've gone from when we started no one's doing what we did so we had to train people yep. from scratch so i guess Wittingly, with my background, ex-military, you mm. always look at people's potential and attitude and for doing stuff. And so we've kind of carried that on as well, that the team we've got is really around attitude mm. and values. Yep. So we recruit to the values we've got around the company about backing each other up, quest, own the quest for the new, celebrate awesome, and, you know, yep. and, and so on. So we very much test people against that for fit. It's also, you know, people that have, motivated capable mm. that want to learn have got a hunger for that and so because you can train anyone but you yep. can't train attitude yes you got the right attitude to begin with mm. so we're very much getting the right people and as i said before that we don't have any quotas around uh you know uh, gender race etc so on but you know we're about 50 percent female mm -hmm. and uh, at all levels within the business and then also we're pretty diverse in culturally as well yes and this is just that we've picked people that are the right attitude and want to join us and want to do this mm -hmm. and we've got a great team that and it, you get a richness from that diversity as well I agree. So. I've been advocating for diversity since I, I know, first came to New Zealand, I think, because I recognise that in a lot of, particularly boards, a lot mm. of boards were all white, male, um, over 60, and mm. even from a, the same kind of background, they were all lawyers or engineers or accountants. And it's like, yeah. come on, guys, how are we going to get the, the, the diversity of thought if we haven't got diversity yeah. in our own groups? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, that's cool. that richness of different ways of doing and different ways of thinking yeah, as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Um, so in terms of um, just thinking around, let's just say somebody's sitting here kind of going, yes, you know, um, we need to use AI. There is definitely merit in it taking away the boring stuff, isn't it? There's a lot of merit yeah. in actually using <clears> this this technology and even robotics to take away the mundane stuff, to free yeah. up people to do yeah. the more value-add stuff. Where do you think, this is a completely random question, but where do you think this is taking us in the future in terms of what about the people who are doing the mundane jobs now? Where do they end up going from there? It's a good question because... Um, in the AI summit that was a few weeks ago in the UK, you had um, British Prime Minister very much given a rosy view of AI as our saviour and there'll be no, it'll create more opportunities and remove them. Then you've got Elon Musk going, no, AI is going to take every job. There'll be no jobs <laughs> yeah. in the future. Yep. And I think you've got to be realistic. And blow us all up. <laughs> yeah. I think it's going to be somewhere in the middle that there's, if you look at, Ev, if you go back to the first industrial revolution, mm. you had the, you know, advent of, like you say, using steam power to you know, do mach have machines then that are in factories and you can produce stuff and the spinning jenny and so on. You basically move people from the land to the cities mm -hmm. and created, created new jobs that never existed before, but there were more jobs created than yeah. they were taken away. True. And again, you also then put technology back into farms to mechanize what was being done there with, because again, person with a horse and a plow could only do so much yes. and you eventually get tractors there and combine harvesters and, and yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so it's added there so there's always but technology has always been disruptive with the business right business model has been disruptive it's changed what the work is and what's value yeah it hasn't moved, removed the jobs yeah yeah so it's moved very much that there was a big value with physical labor to there's a big shift to knowledge-based labor Mm -hmm. And then what's it going to be in the future? Probably around more what humans do best around empathy and creativity, authenticity. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a big shift there. You don't want to compete with a an automation or an AI that can do stuff better than you because you're never going to win yep. um, around that. But there is stuff that if you look at the structure of some organizations, the tendency in the past has been we've got a problem. We won't fix it. We'll just throw people at it to yeah. deal with it. And so you've got a lot of areas that we certainly go in and look at and go, we look at the end-to-end -end process flow, what's going on there, and go, well, and we apply lean techniques of where's the inefficiency there, what's mm. wastage, what's value add. Yep. And again, you focus on what the value add is and remove what the waste is. And so it's a redistribution of the work within and the priority and the value. Mm -hmm. And we call, you know, this process looking at end-to-end -end value streams, where's the value in what you're doing yep. and being done. So it's a similar thing then that you apply technologies like AI as where's 
the best value that's going to deliver where's the best value people are going to deliver mm-hmm. in a kind of process and again it's also going that it's at what levels in an organization where in the past it's very been at the bottom that they've automated low value jobs and I'm trying to move people into higher value it's more in the middle now where it's knowledge workers yeah that you're automating um work but then it's going to create um other opportunities of stuff that was too expensive to do before is now actually much more affordable so it creates new opportunities yeah okay and so on. so it's like digitization of photography um yeah if you look at that that people say the digital camera killed kodak yeah because their bis- business model was around people taking photographs taking in uh, a, a film roll. cartridge yep. and getting it developed and it's around the chemical process and giving you prints it wasn't the digital camera that killed Kodak. They developed some of the best digital technology there is. Uh, yeah. And but it's actually social media that killed them, because basically people were taking photographs, and you know you can share the holiday photos, but all of a sudden you do it digitally and share it instantly. Yeah. And so it creates this whole thing of actually you can the whole thing was about sharing your memories mm-hmm. or sharing what you're doing creates new things then you've now got a whole social media influencers etc you know the ability for us to do a podcast now in the past would have been too prohibitively expensive so it's that democratization of technology and giving it and the masses having access to it creates whole new opportunities mm. and it's like to our kids you know we say what do you want to do when you grow up i go i don't know the job not been invented yet <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah, and it's but probably it's, true yeah and it's, a, and it's like with ai you know, we're only scratching the surface of what we can do with it because we're thinking in, in old ways of working and doing of what it can do mm-hmm. when you get it in it opens up new ways of how you're going to think how you're going to operate and then the capabilities that you want to do around that mm-hmm. but it i mean certainly at the base level it is it's giving access to much more knowledge and information to people than they ever had before yep. that's how you leverage that but it's also you know say from the point of view you could effectively use it for legal advice or drafting contracts all of a sudden you're going what would cost you thousands before to go cost you cents to yep. do yeah so it's all of a sudden oh we can all be a bit more legally protected if we <laughs> wanted to be yeah there are some implications yeah. around that having, um, we actually ran a panel discussion with a whole bunch of lawyers around ai and, and the things you do be aware of but yeah no you're absolutely right i mean it makes those things so much easier so what the job then starts to become, become is actually checking the validity of that data or that it actually makes sense mm. as opposed to the mundane stuff of yeah. what the legal execs used to go through you know backlogs of case studies or not yeah. or legal precedents that kind of stuff now they can get that in a heartbeat right yeah absolutely yeah so it just changes the dynamic of how you're going operate yes and then where you put the focus because mm. it's again it's like with accountancy you spend so much time doing the bookkeeping yeah and then rather than on the management accounting where now you can switch the dynamic to go i can actually give you better advice on what you should be doing rather yeah. than try and bring the information together yeah and that's so again i mean if you think about things like zero change the whole accounting world i mean this is going to change the way we do a lot of things so in terms of your business i'm hoping you use this stuff in your own business yeah, <laughs> yeah? <laughs> so you went through a similar process so you go through and you go right here's our pro- end-to-end process these are where the challenges are this is what we could do and i suppose we use a tool called delegate and elevate where we actually look at going you know what do i love and i'm really great at and where i add most value to the business and the other stuff i can delegate and that's where you could potentially delegate that stuff to another human or to a robot or to yeah. ai or yeah so a similar approach to yourself of going there you know where where where's the real value yes and again we look at our own processes how we engage you know we've looked at the whole life cycle of how you engage customers how you onboard them how you understand the problems and mm-hmm. what's the problem set we kind of built a methodology around that as well because we found that some of the transformation technologies have got some good foundations, but they're not necessarily suited to digi- the digital world mm-hmm. and implementation. So we kind of built stuff out around that and constantly have been evolving it. Yep. And then I guess when people are going, you know, like say, go, what's, people come to you with, I've got this problem, but it's yeah. understandable, like say, oh, what's is the it a real problem? Is it issue? opportunity? Yeah. Is it, <laughs> what's the root cause? Yeah. So yeah, we apply all those. And then again, you know, we use, we're not quite the builder's house but you know we do use <laughs> automation ourselves yep. in a lot of what we do as well yeah and the tools because again mm-hmm. you know it's looking at um ai in the it space and actually using ai to code mm-hmm. and it's it can do it it's not very good at the moment yep but it was going to get better yeah, that's right yeah and it's that thing of go then that you go the life cycle go that okay the third of the time for 
helping a client as a third code in there's requirements and understanding what the use stories are coding testing deploying interacting you know if you can make that 30 percent more efficient that's yeah. great yeah, you can free up those resources. And I think it's not just about, I mean, I, I think everybody is obsessed with chat GPT and, and, and they think of that as being AI, but it's it's a whole lot more than that. I mean, the robotic stuff is really fascinating. I work with a, a, a family business down in the South Island who have a lot of market gardens and then a retail store as well. And I mean, they're now looking at, you know, how do they improve the planting? How do they improve the sorting of the um, fruit and vegetables when it comes out mm. of the ground? All that stuff is actually is actually AI in some respects, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, sitting there, I say it's, for example, you go to Hawke's Bay now and yeah. all the modern orchards are expelliated. So basically the trees are rather than grow up and bush over the top. Yep. They're basically grown up on wires. So then uh, I've closer, seen that. Yeah. Basically you put a robot down them now to pick prune, spray uh, and everything. It's more efficient. Yes. They're designing the orchards for basically automation and using AI. Yeah. Obviously those technologies will have sensors that will look, is the apple right? Mm -hmm. Where's the is there a disease there? Do I need to spray it and yep. stuff? So again, using AI and data and stuff, they're looking at, you know, using less pesticide because they're really targeted. Only it. spraying the ones that actually yeah. need it rather than everything. Really That's targeted. amazing. Yeah, no, I was saying to you before, I mean, when we, I mean, we cycled around the Hawke's Bay um, in the middle of COVID and seeing all that fruit kind of rotting on the ground was just heartbreaking. And I, is that what prompted some of these developments to happen a bit more quickly or has it always been going on? I think it's always, I don't know exactly around that, but you can just see that, there's been a lot of investment in when to replant the orchards of yep. how to do that because at the moment they have to bring in migrant labor to do that yeah. and which you know these guys are great and i know a person that runs a company that does that and really looks after them and yeah it, it was, people are different use from the grapes to the, to the apples and different times of the year and the heat and stuff mm -hmm. but it, i guess it is a constant struggle to get staff for that yeah and it's that kind of where you're going actually if you've got um if you put automation in there, you can run it 24 seven mm -hmm. as well. Yep. Or to look after what you, you, you do in the orchard, you yeah. deal with peaks of, in demand more easily. I was down in Martinborough just recently. Martinborough? Yeah, Martinborough. And I was one, staying on a vineyard and they had like amazingly big kind of fans and heaters that were all um, feeding off the data to see, you know, whether it was getting cold or, or warm and, mm. and changing, you know, the environment. And that's basic kind of yeah. automation, isn't it? But it, it, it makes a difference. But again, it's like, it's big data as well because you've got the technology around the weather, what yep. the forecasts are, you've got sensors in the ground around yeah, you know, the the moisture, moisture yep. uh, nutrients, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Then you're overlaying data onto what grows well, what doesn't, et cetera, <laughs> pests and so on. Yeah. Because it's also then that if you're doing an intervention, what intervention do you need to do? Mm -hmm. and is it, if you've got better data, can you intervene earlier and it's a less chemicals or, yeah. or what you're doing? Or if you're organic, you're plucking something out or whatever. Right, or, yeah. Or the composition of what you've got to put into the soil and so on. Yeah. And then it's also knowing that the, you know, within your land where the grapes grow best and what variety and then yeah. what the sweetness is and acidity at the right time to mm -hmm. pick. And then, yep. And then I guess it's also working with it. You get that data to whoever the winemaker because it's again going what style of wine are they going to do and yep. you know and positioning then for the market and demand because you think the life cycle for a lot of wine is quite long yes yeah hey imagine, yeah, imagine having that information so much earlier i mean it's just going to change the way a lot of things are done even quite basic things but we don't even think of mm. yeah and it's not the kind of gut feel it's actually going on hard yeah going on hard big hard data hard yep data and then also the models for predicting as well yeah. So let's go back to the waste pack report. Well, we'll you start to be it. doing just in time fruit picking, won't we? Yeah. You know, we're going to be pick just, just the right amount of grapes yeah. to actually make enough wine for the, um, for the orders we've got coming in for this, this year. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. And it's, so it's things like that when waste pack did that report to say about you've yeah. got to be leveraging it. Yes. Or well, you look at the competitive advantage you're going to get around that because of your, uh, the quality of your product that you're going to produce, the, uh, your cost of producing a product's lower because you're, you know, you're not mm. waste, your wastage is lower because you only do interventions when you need them to, at the yeah. right time and just the right amount of stuff. Oh, so It's amazing. Hey, I want to go back to the car thing. So you talked about flying cars are more likely to kind of, you know, become um, prevalent than necessarily self-driving cars on the roads ultimately because the, the space is um, less crowded up there. Isn't it more dangerous if they crash? <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> I've just been thinking about this the whole time as I've been thinking about flying cars. It's like risk. <laughs> With risk management, it's a case of a, What's the impact of that risk materializing yep. versus the risk of it happening? Right. Yeah. So it's like aircraft are the most safest form. I know. Of yeah, that's true. Actually. Yeah. But when they do crash, there's a lot of people get yeah, hurt or killed. Yeah. But then, if you look, cars are probably one of the most dangerous mm. because you know 
probability and in the volume. And I guess it's that thing of Go that um, it's interesting because when I was doing one of my uh, RxO community, this global XO of exponential change in a network, yeah. we looked at the whole flying car thing. So we were looking at going, there's something going that, well, actually there's a piece of airspace that you're going, you're basically going to go that you can create effectively lanes of travel. Mm -hmm. You can self-separate. Yep. You don't have pedestrians or cyclists or other vehicles. It's <laughs> yeah, only right. vehicles that do this. Yeah. You've got to be to a certain standard that can communicate and do this. You're suddenly going then that, well, where are you going to take them off to and land them? And you're yeah. going, whether it's heliports or parks or you create tops of building things, you're suddenly going, well, there's probably all this space all you can do. Do this. I mean, the vehicles they've got at the moment, some of them are, you know, two or four people. Initially, they're going to have a pilot. Yep. But it won't be long before they're, they're completely sort of automated. Yeah. They're doing well, I, I was thinking, I talked about this with my husband on, when we were driving somewhere that I was saying, I'm actually looking forward to the, the time when we do have everything is, if you think about, sorry, if you think about if everything was completely automated and you knew you wanted to leave home to be at work by 8.20 in the morning and you could just plug that into a computer and a car or vehicle would turn up and it would take you along with the person who just happens to be 200 metres down the road and can take mm. you along. It's actually going to improve efficiency of travel because you can travel at the maximum speed. You will, it will know how to work out who to pick up and when to pick them up i mean i do think it's going to be amazing when it happens because mm. you won't get stuck in traffic and get really frustrated about the person who's doing you know a little lower than mm. the speed limit in front of you or the person who's doing faster and creating havoc as they go down the motorway yeah, that yeah, will right. all be automated yeah it's interesting because there's um there's a study done on self-driving evs in yep. the states and it's basically going that if you look at vehicles at the moment they're 95 percent not used mm. You only yeah. use them five percent of the time, so you've got an asset that's expensive to buy, that's yes. depreciating. You're paying the maintenance; <laughs> yeah. it's sitting there doing nothing. Then you've got to pay to park it to do nothing, yeah, and so on. So they were going that uh, the utilization of a vehicle, if you have self-drive autonomous, where you don't own it, you just use it when you yeah, need it. Yeah, book it when you need it. So yeah, you're booking it at twenty past eight into town, and it goes off and does other stuff. Yeah, the utilization of those vehicles goes up between sixty to eighty percent. Uh, yeah, um, and it's basically going that. The states, it would say that the true cost of, say, a vehicle of traveling a kilometer is a dollar. Mm -hmm. Where if you do the this fully automated, yep. it's 20 cents. Wow. Yeah. A, a kilometer. So it's like, so the impact on the economy is like trillions of dollars released yep. of, you know, people about $5,000 a year better off mm. by not owning a vehicle, a vehicle. using them when they need them. Yeah. And then the vehicles that get built are then engineered to last longer. Uh, yeah. It then becomes its a play for who owns the fleets or yes. the models within those fleets. Yeah. And, so on. and then I mean, people will say, oh, then I won't have a chance to drive a car. You can still go and buy yourself a race car and race around on the weekends if that's what you want to do, right? <laughs> but, but imagine that, yeah, I've, I've always been fascinated by it. Okay. Um, we can probably talk for hours about yeah. the various things that are available. Um, in terms of, I always ask my guests for three kind of top tips that they can share with people. So maybe if people are thinking about how do I digitize my business? What do I kind of, what can I do with robotics? What can I do with AI? What are your kind of top tips and tools for them? I think the thing is, is uh, don't be afraid to ask. Yeah. So it's like there's people out there that will happy to have a chat with you about what it's about, what the things are and, so it's that thing of, you know, seek knowledge, read up on stuff, not necessarily the media, but go to OpenXO Singularity University. have got some good information on what's going on. Yep. And it's, you know, it's not got a bias on it. Um, the other thing is you, people are good at something and they've started their businesses and they're good at that. And it's the kind of number eight point. I find the number eight when, why a mentality can be a bit disruptive, bit destructive because people try and then do everything themselves. Yes. <laughs> and a lot of this stuff's got moving so fast, you can't be an expert on everything. <laughs> so it's that thing, don't be afraid to ask, don't be afraid to get help in. Mm -hmm. And it's the thing of go that it, it, it's going to be new ways of working and thinking, but it's that thing of go that a journey of a thousand miles starts with one step. Yep. So you need to make that step. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so it's really don't be afraid to ask. Yep. Get some expert advice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and don't be afraid. Take that step and start the journey. Yeah. And I, th I mean, I'm just looking. I'm, I'm assuming you're probably a similar kind of age to myself. You know, it doesn't matter what age you are. You can still always learn about these things and and, yeah. and adopt them into your business, right? Absolutely. You yeah. never, that's a mistake I 
actually had when I thought I'd left school, left university, I don't have to learn a thing again now. <laughs> no, you never stop learning. Yeah, that's right. It's really interesting. You talked about grow or die earlier. One of our values is actually grow or die. And it's all about, you know, if you're not, if you're not learn, learning and growing, you literally are dying. And that's, yeah. that's the way the world is these days. You're yeah. Going backwards, you're going backwards. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So if somebody wants to get in contact with you, I know you said you work with um, businesses of all sizes. Um, what's your ideal client look like and how would they get in contact with you? Um, ideal client is someone that's obviously wanting to do something and um, doesn't matter if a large medium or small yep. you know it we see how this technology with the right approach can help people mm -hmm. basically you know with their productivity or you know efficiency or competitive advantage or differentiation that's really we've got a website which is quantum q a n t o n dot co dot nz yep or you know can email myself my details are on the website. Yep. So, yeah. And we can find you on LinkedIn yeah, too, right? That's Gary with two G's. Two Gary, R's. <laughs> sorry, R, sorry. Gary, that was, yeah. that was a blonde moment. Yeah. Gary with two R's, green, and then, um, well, it's also two G's, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and obviously with content as well in, in, that, in that title. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, hey, look, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Yeah. Thank you for coming you on the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure too. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the podcast show, Better Business, Better Life. My name is Deborah Chantry-Taylor. I'm an EOS implementer, family business advisor, business and leadership coach, podcaster, and speaker. However, I'm also a business owner with several current business interests. I'm fortunate to have lived the high life with all the lifestyle, the toys, you name it, and then I've lost it all, not only once, but twice in two spectacular train wrecks. I know what it's like to experience the highs and lows. I came across EOS when they launched into New Zealand using my Entrepreneur's Playground and Event Centre in Parnell, Auckland. I love the simplicity of the tools and their philosophies fitted my personal brand statement perfectly. The brilliance is in the simplicity. I've always been passionate about seeing entrepreneurs lead a life they love, and now I help them live that EOS life. Doing what they love, with people they love, making a huge difference in the world, being compensated appropriately, and with time to pursue other passions. If you want more information or want to get in contact about using EOS in your business, you can visit my website at debra.coach. That's www.debra.coach. Thanks for listening.